Yes, so the main points of this talk is uh, what is Kubernetes? And we need them to know a little bit about Docker for this all to make sense, because without Docker, Kubernetes doesn't kind of work. Uh, what does Kubernetes solve? Short thing, and then I hope to show you a live demo of operating on Kubernetes. So uh, to start with, just for me to know where to put the emphasis in the talk, uh, how many of you are using Kubernetes with one of your applications today? So a few, okay, that may be one fourth. Um, many kind of know what Kubernetes is. Okay, a little bit more, that's cool. Uh, does anyone not know anything about Docker, basically? Hands up. Yeah, a few? Okay, cool. So we'll start from there. So what is Kubernetes? So if you go on YouTube or if you look at some blog post or something where someone tries to explain it, it's usually that you see something like this. It's a system for orchestrating containers. It starts kind of. So you see the conductor and like shipping container. And yeah, there is a chance that you are starting to look like Eminem looks at here. <laughs> You're starting to uh, try to explain this thing from using words that are already inside the system, right? So we will try to explain it using kind of words that are normal, that are outside the sphere, so to speak. So. What is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is, by the way, often shortened with K8S, uh, which you can see when you are looking for some documentation online and such. So what is it? Described for a normal computer person, it's actually an operating system for clusters. So it's like turning like one or many computers to something like a supercomputer. When I'm saying that it's a supercomputer, it's you're going to one place and you're controlling all of this using your command line or using a dashboard or something. That's making it a supercomputer because you are not doing something, uh, you are not even interested on which computer what is happening. That is kind of making it a supercomputer. So what kind of applications run on uh, Kubernetes? So, uh, of course, if you are on Windows, you know that you are downloading the Windows version of the software. If you are on uh, Mac OS, you will probably download something that is installable on, on, and built for Mac. So if you're on Kubernetes, you're running containers. So for this to make sense, we have to go through what containers are and we are going into Docker now. So Docker. Um, I'm just taking the main parts that are interesting from this, con uh, from this context. So it's lightweight virtualization. We'll talk about what that means. Then Docker runs on Windows, OS X, and Linux. It's very, very popular, and you can basically go to their site and you will have instructions how to install regardless of what laptop you have. So you can install it, and of course the cool thing is that if you have a Docker image, it will run identically on all, and that's kind of the point. So, uh, and the third thing that is very important is the Docker repositories that make Docker images universally available. So once you have pushed, pushed something, it's available all around the world if you have an internet connection. And that's also a very important concept for Kubernetes because of getting the program to the cluster, regardless of where the cluster is. Uh, what do we mean by lightweight virtualization? So, um, okay, hands up again. Uh, anyone that uh, is using some kind of virtual machine, either a web host or they have virtual box installed or something. Using, or I mean that you have had it running. I mean, it should be most of the people in the, in the room. And that's the point, that's why I'm even mentioning it, because we will be talking about the differences and similarities from a normal virtualization. Where virtualization basically is that you have a computer running and on that computer you have an operating system, but there's also a hypervisor or a program that is running another operating system or more of them inside that computer, right? That's the point. When you are uh, renting some, some computer from a web hoster, you also get the virtual computer from them, basically. So, uh, okay, so what is similar with a VM? 
we are running identically regardless of the host machine. So we can basically move this virtual disk or something between machines and we can start the same computer as it was. Um, we have an emulated network card or a very controlled network environment. So this computer in the computer cannot like talk to whatever it wants without us allowing it. And the point also, and one of the most important parts is it cannot change anything on the real host. So uh, if you want to try out some software, you are just thinking it might be bad. You can even th uh, start it up in a virtual computer and if it's a virus, kind of it just dest destroyed that, but you can just wipe the image and everything is fine, right? Cannot change anything on the host. So differences from a virtual machine is that it's the file system that is attached to a Docker is actually a completely faked file system that is just there while the program is running. And that's the second point actually, that a Dockerized application is not a full virtual machine. It's just a complete fake around your program. So your program is like built and tucked in, you know, like in the bed with something that it thinks is kind of an operating system because it feels like it from its perspective, but it's only actually the application running inside this thing. And the file system is completely faked and the network is, is uh, limited to what you want. Kind of clear so far? Yeah. Uh, so the result is that we have a very low resource overhead here. If you have tried to run a virtual box, even if you have a kind of beefy, you know, game rig or something like 128 gigabytes of RAM and 32 cores or something, it doesn't matter. I, I can, you know, bet with you that if you start like 30 Windows 10 on it, it will go slow overall. <laughs> it will be really bad. Because you're running like 30 Windows as with all the things that Windows thinks is very important for you. For instance, delivering ads and other very important stuff, of course. So, um, Docker, as I said, it's just building an environment around your application. So it's actually like, building in uh, this thing. So it's only your application running with this emulation layer and it's actually your operating system that's driving everything. That's the important part, which results in even a laptop being able to run hundreds or even thousands of small lightweight applications without any problem. They start as fast as basically native and it's really, really eff efficient in that way. So, <clears throat> Um, I don't know if we have mentioned it, but the Docker image. We're talking about Dockerizing the application. So the Docker image is kind of the template. And the container, now we are talking about the container, is the running program. Once you run an image, it becomes a container, and it's running as long as the Dockerized application is running, and then the container kind of dies. So just to understand, I hope that you understand kind of the metaphor here, that this is kind of the thing that you're doing, the form you're using to create the cake, right? And that is the real cake. Uh, inside the Docker image, there is all the information that is needed for this fake file system to come to life for the container once it starts. So all the files and stuff. And <coughs> um, looking from, from bottom here, if you have your computer, it might be your desktop, or your laptop or something, and then you have your operating system, whatever you like to run, and then you have Docker installed. That we said, you can just go to that page and do it. Then we have the Dockerization of your application if you want to run your application here. So you have something called the base image, then you have the application and the application libraries. Application libraries here is nothing more strange than your package JSON file, right? The things that you want to include that are needed for your application to run, basically. So, <clears throat> since the base image is often based on some Linux or something, it might sound mm, daunting or something that uh, to create something like a base image. But that's why I did this. So I said that what does a typical user need to do? You basically only need to know what base image you want to use. And why is that? Because, <clears throat> sorry. There are base images for almost everything. So <clears throat> if you're using one of the 
500 or maybe 1,000 most used you know, application, web server frameworks, web frameworks uh, languages, you will find images for them. And often, if you are using the big ones, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> If you're using the big ones like .NET Core, like Node.js, um, PHP, Java, Spring, and lots of other things, uh, usually it's all, even the ones that are creating the language that are providing you the official image. So you don't even have to, you know, kind of worry. It is what they wanted you to run. Like um, Microsoft is making the .NET Core images, for instance, both the runtimes, but also the images needed so you, that you can actually compile your program if you want, if you're running .NET Core, without having .NET Core installed on your computer. So it's part of the build step, pulling down an image that is actually the compiler, compiling your whole program, and then bundling it together with a runtime. Pretty cool, but we are a Node.js meetup group, so we will not go into that. Um, so, example Docker file for Node. This is a real file that we will be using in our example soon, so this is no fake, no simplification or anything. This is the only thing we have to do when it comes to the base image. This is a name or a Docker image reference to the base image of, uh, of Node.js version 19. Uh, going through the lines is okay. Work there is that in this fake file system, we will create a directory that is called app, uh, there we will first copy the package JSON, including package log JSON, since you see it, there is an asterisk there. We are running npm install inside this environment. Then we are copying the rest of the files into the app. And in one interesting thing, so if we have some exposed port, we are explicitly telling it here. And it's part of this to have complete control over all the networking going on. So here we will only have this port available from outside using this. Container. Last thing is we need to configure inside our package JSON file so that when we run npm run start, the program will fire up because this is actually what happens at the last step when the image comes up and becomes a container. Um, building a Docker image. I'm going for the name that I'm using for the demo later on. But it looks like this. We are using the command docker build and then we are just tagging it and this tag um, to simplify, it's basically a unique name in the world on the internet. And why is that? Okay, so when we are doing Docker build, we are actually just building this image. So that, that what happened inside this file is then executed on my local computer, and we are building it and we are putting it into my kind of local repository on my computer. So a Docker image has this reference, as I said. So this is one of the references, as we said, but they can also look like the one we saw in the beginning of the Docker file is also a, a complete reference that is only one in the world because it's the official node 19. And for instance, Microsoft, when it comes to their, uh, I think it's their runtime image for ASP.NET 7, looks like this. And in that case, you see that there's also a kind of address. Part of this is that in Docker, uh, everything is open source, so even though Docker is providing a repository that is kind of theirs, and this is also their kind of default namespace, everyone can set up their own repository, basically. You just need to, you know, configure it and set it up as a normal server service. So many are doing that. Um, and, okay, might be interesting to say that um, just like GitHub is for source, where it's okay to, for you to have an unlimited number of uh, repositories as long as you are pushing up only open source, and you start to pay at the moment where you want to have some private things, right? Because they want to encourage the open source. Basically, almost all the repositories, because there are many companies providing this now, you can go to tens of them. Uh, basically, most of them have the same thing. Uh, as long as you have open images, you don't care you're just pushing it up and it's all available on the internet. If you care and if it's a company thing or something, it might be that you don't want to push everything out uh, available for everyone. And then you pay actually at a small sum, like I think it's like five or seven dollars a month per person. Just because it's such a competition, right? It's open source so anyone can put one of those services up. 
yeah, so pushing a Docker image from the local computer, I'm standing in my computer and writing Docker push and the same name, and bam, it goes to my repository that I have configured. So Docker images are universally available. And the nice thing about the Docker image as compared to, for instance, a Git repo, is that, uh, let's say that I'm, okay, I don't know if it's very similar, but anyways, if I'm uh, stuck programming, and I have tried to debug something, and I'm actually asking my colleague Erica to debug something, but I'm saying that I cannot figure it out. You are smarter than me. So I can only on the chat give her this name, this uh, Docker image reference, and she will be able to pull it wherever she is, right? And she will be able to run it in exactly the same way. So it's not like, oh, I'm running on Windows and she's running on Linux, so maybe it's a path problem and she doesn't even see the problem and doesn't know what I mean. Everything will be running in exactly the same because it's a lightweight virtualization. It's running the same way at her computer, regardless of our base operating systems. So now we know enough for uh, Kubernetes of Docker. Docker is, of course, a bigger thing, but this is what we need to know for this, the rest to make sense. So why Docker images? Okay, so they solve the problem of program distribution, as we said. We are just using those um, Docker image references, which basically is like a URL or email address, right? It's something unique that you can use to access that artifact. Um, it runs identically on all computers, as we said, so if we have a cluster of lots of computers that will be helping out running things, it's cool that all the things are running in the same way, uh, regardless of kind of what library versions are installed on the servers themselves and such. And in the end, of course, virtualization, so it's a very low overhead. We are not firing up complete operating systems to run all our applications here. Kubernetes-based concepts, yes. Uh, I have focused on those three things, even though there are, of course, tens of different concepts, abstract concepts, that they have chosen to define inside Kubernetes. But I feel that these are the main ones that are enough for you, actually, to start out using Kubernetes, and you will figure the rest out on the way without any problem. So starting with the deployment, it's, um, it's a... Uh, config files inside the Kubernetes are called manifests. They're doing a little bit of a joke because manifest is a C thing or Mariner thing, right? On a uh, ship you have manifests defining whatever is on the ship. So, so they are calling it manifest, but it's nothing more than a config file. Um, so a deployment, a config file for a deployment, a manifest for a deployment, is basically a description of how a service should be working. I'm not saying an instance now, I'm saying a service. So it may, it may be that you are saying that this uh, service should be running all the time in 10 instances, and that's part of the definition. And when you push this into the Kubernetes cluster, it will do everything it can to balance this and make this happen. If there is at one point nothing of this running, it will first maybe go, go and pull Docker images to be able to start it up if they are not even uh, there yet if they are already there and there is one running and you push a config with 10, it will try to balance it by starting up more. And it will choose whatever computers are in the clusters uh, in a sensible way because it's also an operating system in a way that it's scheduling, right? It's like choosing good places to run things. So all of this is something that you don't have to worry about, which is part of the things making Kubernetes awesome. Pods are basically in our concept here, like the containers. Okay, it's a little bit more complex than that, but for our purposes, it's completely okay to just say that they are the containers. So if we have a deployment and we say that three of these should be running at all times, then we are meaning uh, that there will be three pods which basically are three containers running somewhere in the cluster. Finally, services is a way to define how things are going in and out of the cluster because you might appreciate that having like even 100 instances running inside a cluster of something that cannot manifest itself outside of the cluster it has no meaning at all. So uh, an example, Kubernetes deployment. Now this might be too small for some of you to see, I don't know. 
Did you see it back there? Something? Is it? Okay. Oh, yeah, okay, yes. So uh, it might seem a little bit big, but it's not actually that big because it is just a few sections here. Uh, when we have this kind of manifest, it, it kind of starts with this kind, which says what kind of manifest is this. This is for a deployment, so at once when the Kubernetes is reading this in, it knows what category of things we are creating or modifying. Then we have the name of the deployment, which I happen to like to call dash deployment, so that I al always, when I see the resource, I see that it's a deployment we're talking about. Then the replicas is basically the number of instances we want to be running. Uh, then we have the app and the labels, which I call the same that the app is called. So our app for today's demo will be minimal DB. This is, okay, now you see what Docker was for, right? If I build the image, we don't have to do any magic to get this program into the cluster, regardless of if it's a cloud or locally or something like that. I'm not, you know, fooling around with some special zip file or some exe files or something and sending them somewhere. They are just there. That's all. And finally, we have environment variables, which I trust most of you know what it is. So it's just config for it because I wanted this to be a little bit realistic app. So it's actually, we are talking to it from outside, but it's also talking to a database that is outside the cluster. So we have both in and out, if you understand me. That's why I chose to do it that way. So you see that this is not just a Hello World toy, it's actually something that could be extended to be a real service. Uh, finally, we have container port, and you see 3000 as we had in the Docker file, so no surprises there. So how many pods, right? Pods is number of replicas. Uh, services, as I said, from the internet or from the rest of the network, into the Kubernetes and how the Kubernetes talks to something outside or pods inside Kubernetes. Because remember, when Kubernetes fires up, it creates its own network or networks. You can set it up as you want. And it's completely different from your uh, local LAN. Even if the nodes are actually on your local network, that's one thing. But what happens in the cluster stays in the cluster unless you define how it uh, infiltrates or ex exfiltrates. Um, that was basically about the Kubernetes. So what does it solve then? Wh why would we care? And why put some effort into, into making it? It solves some things. It solves like, first thing is that it's like built so that if you have several computers running, you don't have to go for the very extremely expensive hardware where you have the redundancy kind of built into that the hardware should not fail that much because Kubernetes is built in a way that, that is encouraging you to build services that are running in, mul in multiples, which means that if one computer falls out of this and, and kind of dies, the rest of the world doesn't know. As long as you have enough like a, a capacity in the cluster so that one computer's fallout doesn't affect the performance of the rest of the container, so to speak, it shouldn't be a big problem as long as you're running your services in several instances, which is the normal way of doing it, by the way. We are looking for stateless services. Uh, secondly, it's like cloud and on-prem. So on-prem, you know what it is, right? It's if you're running your own servers at, at your server room in the office or something like that. Uh, it's the same config. It's, it's not like you have a completely different setup if you are running in the cloud or not. You have the same config. And it also, it's a little bit like a democratization thing in the computing world because before you had the big dragons like AVS and Azure and uh, Google Cloud and such, you had to be kind of big to start and say, okay, we are building a cloud here. But with Kubernetes, now even smaller hosters that before were limited to just offer you VPSs, like you know, virtual private servers for some hosting and such, they are now in many cases setting up uh, Kubernetes. So you can just with one click press Kubernetes they are only interested in, in renting you a computer or, or several of them. So they are just happy if you press start a Kubernetes cluster and you fire up three computers, it's just a win-win for them, right? 
but it also means that you can create programs that are for Kubernetes that will be running super on Azure, but also super on maybe, I don't know, DigitalOcean, just to drop some name, right? It's a smaller hoster that would no, not normally be able to do something like Azure. Uh, of course, also the possibility to run locally. Um, I would just drop one name, but there are several options today. If you are running Ubuntu or some of the derivatives of operating systems, then you can run something called micro, uh, micro, micro Kates, which is micro Kubernetes. Uh, and uh, you install kind of uh, Kubernetes running a few very simple scripts then, and you can run it on your own laptop. And the nice thing about it is that you can try out the same manifest on your laptop and then you will be fairly sure that if everything runs correctly, it will run very similarly inside a, a cluster, a real cluster. So again, very similarly to what, why we are, want to use the Docker, because it will behave very similarly regardless of where we run it. The same with all the manifest and stuff. Um, and then uh, sensible behavior. Okay, we are going into things that are kind of too deep to dwell about, but I can just uh, mention one thing that I think is kind of cool. It's like rolling updates. If we go to, back to our application, do some changes, we build a new image that we talked about and push it, and then inside the manifest file, we kind of change the version. So we go from like uh, version 104 as we had to 105, and then we change the manifest file for Kubernetes. And we apply this uh, manifest file. The Kubernetes default way of handling it is to, uh, if you have, for instance, three instances, it will actually fire up a new instance of uh, the new version. And if it works for a little while, so it kind of deems that it's living, then, then it will first kill one of the old pods. And in that way, it will replace all the pods in a running system. And usually, if you have been writing your, your uh, services in a sensible, non-stateful way, users will not even see that you changed the version. It will, it will happen completely on the fly because it's completely synchronized with all the load balancers and the network inside Kubernetes. And this is built in. You can, of course, override it if it's not to your liking this uh, behavior. But I'm just saying that it's kind of cool to have this. Just imagine how much you have to write in your own application to kind of get this behavior uh, by yourself. So live demo, yes. Uh, I want to show you the dashboard of Kubernetes um, in my own installation that is for testing purposes. And I want to show you the deployment and service definition and scaling of an application. That's kind of what we will be doing. But we will be taking a quick look on the application first. So let's see here if we can. So I will start with just uh, getting a token to the dashboard so that we can access it. Can you install with the terminal? Yeah, I can do that. It's so funny to have the screen now here. <laughs> Settings. Okay, it's a little bit better. Yeah, 
So we are inside the cluster and we can just uh, see the overview. So right now, of course, we have other of my stuff going there. So we don't have to care that much about it. But you see that it says deployments and you have some deployments running kind of in this. So our thing will be that we will start yet another thing that is running inside this cluster, basically. Um, so yes, we see that there, there are deployments, but we can also look if we look at the pods here. That was what I was meaning. You see that there are lots of things to know which you don't need to start. So if you go to the pods, you will see that there are some, you know, you see that you see, you see use this deployment, for instance, there are several instances running. So those are the containers running inside the cluster. Anyways, let's get back here and let's see if we can look at our testing uh, application. have created this application called the minimum DB. I will not actually be building the Docker image as, at this point, but I just wanted to show you this small project. This is a small application. We will be checking, first we can check the Docker file, so you see that I haven't been cheating. This is exactly what we saw before. This is what's needed to build a Docker image of this program. And <clears throat> under source, we will see the very, very small implementation which is basically, you see that we are defining some those environment variables to get the parameters to connect to the DB because we want to have a real database on the other end. And then we are just supporting one endpoint at this point where we are doing select one as the column name one, just to see that we are talking to the database. And that's basically it. And I think, yeah, and there we have the 3000 that has been going around all those uh, configurations so far, as you have seen. So this is the program that we will be running. Uh, and uh, in my case, I'm using Docker Hub, so maybe I can show you that. So this is where we are kind of pulling the the image from. I have already built it before, as you understand, but um, I'm just showing you where the image is pulled from if it isn't already on the cluster. So you see there, there I have this uh, 104 image there. So this is the image actually that we will be uh, using for starting up inside the cluster. And now we will go to see some of the configuration files. Um, yeah, it's too bad you will have to see one of my passwords now, but uh, uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, so we have the deployment file. We were, we were through this before, so we are kind of not shocked to see this, right? Okay, I have a few more replicas than we thought about, talked about, but you see that we are still pointing out this exact image that we are talking about. And we will be kind of just pushing it into Kubernetes and, okay, start this, right? Or add this. So Kubernetes is here, we are on deployment. Uh, and I'm minimizing this, I go back here. Oh, I will just change so we are not using six of them to start with, but rather one. And we use this command to control Kubernetes from the command line. It's kube control apply minus F and then the YAML file, which is the manifest. So it's the only thing we are doing. You see that it said created. This uh, deployment created. If we go back to the uh, dashboard, we are seeing that the minimal deployment is already there. It already says that it's running one of one pods as it is, and it was uh, 19, 20 seconds ago it started. So now it's running inside there, but we have nothing to show for it. Okay, I will show you one more thing. Now we are going to the services because we will have to define one service to be able to talk to this guy inside the cluster, right? Everything needs to be defined when we are talking in, into this. But I will also show you first the service that is already defined that is used to talk to the database. That was made before, so I'm just showing you it, it for you. And this is the MariaDB service. Just so you 
see that it's, it's nothing strange. It's basically saying that in my local network, we have this address. And there we have the MariaDB service, and it's the normal port and such for this database. The important part here is, that I want to, to show you is that, okay, look at this name. It's MariaDB-Service, okay? So remember that now. Uh, if we go to, oops, that one, and we are looking a little bit on this deployment again, you see that the DB host that I'm indicating here is MariaDB-Service, right? So that's the magic sauce here. I'm just saying the name of the service and that kind of makes uh, Kubernetes do with all the magic to point all uh, the started pods from this, get this as, get the correct, you know, connection on this name to that outside database that is on, on the network somewhere else. That is all. So this is just, I'm just showing you how to do the link. There is no more magic to it than this. It's the name that is connecting it. Uh, okay, so now you know that, and we go back, and we are actually uh, going to look at the other service, which will enable us to talk to this guy from outside, because th this was, of course, so the, the program can talk to the database, but now we're talking about how do we talk to the program inside. Uh, so we will find... Uh, oh, okay. Mm. Looks like this. It's kind of easy. The important part here is that we have the name minimal DB service. Again, I'm calling it service just to know whether that is that kind of a resource. And I'm doing something that is called node port. That is the simplest way of exposing a service that is inside a cluster uh, to the outside. And what I'm saying here is that the target port inside the uh, you remember, it's again 3000, it's all the way 3000 from we created the program that was opening port 3000. But this time we are saying, okay, what will be the port on the outside? And we are doing node port 30002. And what that means is that every node in the cluster as it is now will respond on this port 30002. Uh, and it will kind of route the, all the calls that are coming there. It will go to port 3000 inside pod or pods that are running uh, on the target port 3000. And you see, okay, also the app selector, that's why we are actually pointing to minimal DB, right? So this is pods from this application, also important because many applications can be using internally the port 3000, right? That is not a, a significant thing. Um, so let's see here. Maybe we could first just show you that there is nothing on those machines listening on 30,002 at, uh, at this point. Uh, because I mean, so I'm not cheating or anything. So you see that when I'm going to one of the nodes and I'm trying to do a curl here, we got connection refused. So obviously nothing is listening right now. And what I'm trying to show you is that if we take this, uh, that this service and we now apply it into the Kubernetes cluster, we will basically say, take this into effect. So, uh, yeah, we will just apply this one as well, and we have the minimal uh, DB service created. If we go over to the dashboard and we look at services again, we should have a new service here, minimal DB service that is you know, created right now. And at this point, if we go to and do some curling, hopefully I will also make this a little bit bigger. So you see, now we get some output from that curl. Whoops, now we started with something I wanted to show you later. Uh, any, anyway, so yes, so now we have this uh, service running, as we said. Whoops, I don't even see the bottom part here. Um, okay, 
Um, and now I wanted to do some, some uh, performance tests. So we will be sending 10,000 requests now. Do you know the tool AB, by the way? It's Apache Bench. It's one of the simplest tools you can run like locally just to see what happens on the system if you uh, spam it with some requests and see just what happens. So it's, uh, if you don't know it, it's, it's a cool thing to, to have access to. Uh, so we are doing A, B, we're saying that we want to do 10,000 requests with a concurrency of 200. So it will try to open like 200 connections at the same time. And, and uh, as soon as it's finished with one connection, it will fire up another one. Uh, and then we are just saying where we are going. And we are going to exactly the same thing that we were curling before. So if we run this guy, we will see. So uh, we have this, okay, 2,500 requests per second. And now we have one Node.js running, right? And it actually has to bounce all the way to the database also, and they just get this query done as well. So, but uh, two and a half thousand requests per second, and this is on, on one process. So we will try to just uh, fire up some more and see if there is a difference, because much of this uh, running is also cool if we are able to get some <clears throat> performance benefit from it, right? The scaling part. So we go back here and we are looking at the deployment. And in this case, we can just uh, upper this. So we go back to six as I had before. I save it and I'm applying the deployment here. And you see that it says that it's configured, not created, but configured. So it just took the new config. We can go back to the dashboard and we see that it's already running like six of them. Um, if you are firing up an application for, for the first time with Docker, by the way, it might take some a few you know, seconds or minutes to pull down the image the first time, but that's, normally it just starts as, as, as soon as it's cached. So now we have like six of them running. So let's see if we get some other uh, performances when we are trying this. I should say that the computer I'm running from is very, very weak, so. I hope that we will see some difference. Now we have 5,900, right, requests per second. Even a bit, yeah, uh, 7, uh, 6,700 requests per second. So in this way, I also wanted to say, because this is a Node.js meetup group, um, we normally program, so we are programming for one thread, right, as you know. And uh, sometimes people are doing some acrobatics with the, I don't know, they are doing the, the cluster module and stuff to just, just try to make nodes use more of the resources in the computer. Yeah, uh, as stateless as possible and just run as it should. And then you should scale it inside the Kubernetes. That's the point. Uh, don't put any scaling inside the application because it just makes the code more harder to, to do. And as we said with the automatic, you know, uh, the, the automatic rollover, um, uh, updates and such things that, that Kubernetes is providing you, it will take you like, you know, lots and lots of times to try to build around this and make the same functionality that you get out of the box here. So Node.js is working really, really good together with, uh, with uh, Kubernetes. So basically I would say this was, this was the uh, presentation. That was what I wanted to show you.